Perfection isn't easily achieved. It takes hard work, dedication, and perseverance. Through their commitment to excellence, Sage Fruit Company has been supplying customers with the best tree fruit in the Pacific Northwest for over three generations. They work hard on the farm, in the packing facilities, and with their retail partners to provide consistent, high-quality apples and pears all year long. Look for Sage Fruit at your local grocery. Good afternoon, everybody. We welcome you to the Sage Fruit Stage live here at the Jackson Motorplex in Jackson, Minnesota. Tonight, night number two of the Agco Jackson Nationals powered by Fent as we get set to go. Sean Neistead, Chase Rodman, our first guest is here. Logan Schuhart, welcome uh, back to Jackson. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to be here. You've had plenty of success at this racetrack. Uh, let's just jump right back into that. Four career World of Outlaw wins at this racetrack, two-time Jackson Nationals champion. Tell us about that. Yeah, we had a good role there going for a few years. Um, you know, I just feel like we hit on something that, that really worked good. Uh, it seemed like every time we rolled out of the box here, we were, we were quick, qualifying on, and uh, that always makes you feel confident. You know, confidence is kind of key when it comes to sprint car racing, and, uh, you know, we just felt really good as soon as we pulled the car out of the trailer. So. I think the tires and stuff have changed things a little bit. You know, I, we ran the same setup that we've ran here for years here last night and uh, just didn't feel near as good, especially there in the A main time. So um, things change. You got to switch it up. But, uh, you know, props to our, our guys, Brandon and Lonnie. They work really hard to try and, you know, we're going to change some things tonight and see if we can get a little bit better. We keep hearing drivers talk about how with the change of the tire, uh, the cars feel different this year. Try to explain to us what the difference in the feel is. Yeah, they just, uh, in a way, there's a little bit left, I guess you could call it spring rate in the left rear tire, so it's it's a little bit looser feeling. Um, sometimes they feel like they're just as grippy as, as the old tires, uh, but then when you get in the in the slick, they sometimes they feel like they're a little bit looser. So um, just a little more spongy and kind of, you know, the car will rock around a little bit more, not a stable feeling, I guess you could describe it in a way um, but it just kind of there's there's not a whole lot to these sprint cars so um, small changes can go a long way and when you change something like a tire like that um, it can just change the whole package of your race car been a pretty successful year, I would say, so far. Three wins, including that Eldora Million. Three outlaw wins, I should say, and then you add the million on top of that. Fourth in points uh, so far. How would you uh, assess the this, this season so far as we're about around the halfway point? Yeah, I think we've run well at some races. You know, there's some races that, you know, haven't counted for points. We've lost. I feel like this is the least. I would like to know the stats on it, but I feel like this is the least amount of points races that we're going to run this year as far as none of the Houston's uh, races were points. Um, you know, last night was, but, you know, we lost two races at Eldora. Um, you know, Knoxville never is. But um, some of these racetracks, I feel like we're losing some of our points races that we, for our team run well at. So, um, but we're as far as you know being consistent you know i don't feel like we're as consistent as the three guys in front of us but uh i feel good about it as far as working with two new guys this year um you know as the season started we started out really hot in florida i thought and you know right there you know leaving leaving florida with the points leader right there for it with gravel and then uh when we switched the tires it kind of it was a learning period for us we kind of really fell behind for a while and then uh, the past couple months, like you said, we've been we've been fast. So the uh, important thing is we're gaining on it. You know, we're learning and, and getting better. And, um, you know, the longer this year goes and the more we're working well together, I, I look forward to next year. Now, let's switch gears a little bit here. Obviously, some pretty big news here recently with Jacob getting out of the seat a little bit here. What's that kind of like now, showing up to the racetrack? And, you know, a guy you've been showing up to the racetrack with for 10 years now, and, he, and he's not here. you got somebody else in the car. Is that a little bit different? Is that kind of a weird feeling? It's definitely a weird feeling for me. I know it's weird for my grandpa. And, um, you know, most of all, it's, you know, what we're thinking about. We just want Jake to be happy with whatever he's he wants to do and whether he just needs a break from racing right now or, or whatever it is, you know, that's the, the most important thing to us. You know, for me is looking at him as a brother, you know, I just want him to be happy with whatever he's doing. So, um, but Tanner's obviously is doing a great job. You know, he's only in the car two races, uh, finished third last night. Um, good kid, good family. And, uh, you know, has a great following. And uh, we just thought he'd be a good fit for, for the car, you know, going out west. 
um, kind of similar to, to Jacob and I as far as a, you know has his own car. It's not going to tear up stuff. Um, it's going to you know gas it up, but you know kind of be you know cautious of you know treating it like his own stuff. And um, just felt like he was a good kid and, and fitting for it. So uh, my grandpa went down and talked to him, and they were able to work something out. So uh, happy he's filling in the seat. And like I said, he did a great job last night. We talk about teams and drivers, and I know we've talked with you about that before, that you know maybe your car is not the same as Jake's on a night. So uh, coming into a night like last night, how much did you share with Tanner and, and team over there to try to get him going in the track he'd never been at before? Well, we always try to help each other out. When Jacob was driving or Tanner's driving it, you know, it's my grandfather's cars. I want to see that car run well, um, you know, for my grandfather. and and. and um, Tyler and Blake, they do an awesome job. They help us. Our guys help on the 1A. So, um, you know, vice versa. Shark Racing, we, you know, we tell anybody when they come to, to help at, at Shark Racing that we, you know, we treat this as one team. Um, we want each other helping each other out. And um, no, I mean, Jake ran good here last year. He's been fast here. So I feel like the car was going to be fast. And, and Tanner did a great job filling in and uh, being fast right off the bat. Chase talked about the three wins so far on the year, sitting well in the point standings. So now that we're, we're past Knoxville, that's always like that point in the season where things turn and now it's kind of that downhill slide heading towards uh, World Finals coming up. What's the goal for the rest of the season? What do you want to accomplish yet this year? Well, I'd like to make a charge at those guys in front of us. I'd like to get the consistency up that we're, you know, consistently on the podium, uh, knock out a few more wins, and just feel like we're going into next year stronger than, you know, you never want to end the season on, on a downhill slide. So uh, just be strong, you know, the, the rest of the year. We, you know, we've run well on the West Coast, and so I'm looking forward to that. Go out there and hopefully uh, run well and come back to our, our home state. And, and, you know, we picked off our first win in 10 years at Williams Grove Speedway. So hopefully we'll have something for him at the Williams Grove National Open. And then, uh, like you said, Charlotte's always been a good one for us. So we got some racetracks coming up here at the end of the year um, in this last swing uh, that, you know, we just hope to be strong. You guys always, I feel like, want to go racing as much as you can, right, uh, throughout the season. And it seems like coming up here pretty quick uh, over the next couple of weeks, there is a lot of racing. Obviously, we had four nights last week, three this week, only two next week. But then after that, three at Skagit, three more Chico. Seems like a lot of three-day shows coming up and a lot of racing for you guys to get to. Yeah, it's always, you know, it, it feels like after Knoxville, it slows down a little bit. Um, but only for, you know, a week or two usually. And then once we get out to that West Coast, it's like another speed week. Uh, speed week and a half anyways uh, until you get back to the East Coast and then it does feel like it slows down a little bit but um, no like I said I'm looking forward to it. we didn't get out to the West Coast at the beginning of the year you know, I know the California fans are, are eager to have us out there and uh, those racetracks have been good to us so I think they're fun fans are passionate and uh, you know shark racing's had some success out there so I look forward to it obviously you've been out here way longer than me but I feel like the second, like after Knoxville, is kind of like you said, the season slows down or it has in the last couple of years or, you know, previous years. But it seems like now there's more high paying races after Knoxville. I feel like usually, you know, just National Open, right? But now this week in 25,000, Skagit also is up there. Silver Dollar's up there. Uh, obviously, the National Open. It seems like there are more events now after Knoxville to look forward to than there was maybe five, six years ago, right? Yeah, it's really good to see. I, since I've started, the sport's growing and growing and growing. So, um, you know, it's crazy to think about, you know, the Kings Royal, we used to think, man, 50,000 to win, that's, you know, that's our major event or crown jewel. And now if you get a 50,000 to win, you know, Kings Royal, it'd feel like nothing. But um, <laughs> yeah, to have this many races that are paying over 100,000, over 50,000, over 20,000, it's just cool to see the sport growing with streaming services. Obviously to do that, you gotta have fans involved and fans showing up, you know. Um, you know, it's great to see fans coming out and being a part of this event a week after Knoxville. It's not that far away and, and fans are showing up camping and having a good time. So uh, as a driver, that's what you want to see. How cool is it? I was going to ask that, but how cool is it as a driver when you're at, you know, the High Bank Nationals at Houston Saturday night, you get out of the car and look up and the stands are full or Eldora, which was absolutely packed or the Nationals that was sold out. I mean, that just has to be a cool feeling as a driver, right? Definitely. I mean, it's. I mean, you look up in the stands and there's, you know, ha only half full. It doesn't. I'm not the promoter. I doesn't. I don't make any, you know, more money. I finish on how I or make money on how I place. But, uh, 
Yeah, just when you look up in the stands, there's nobody in it. It doesn't make you feel good, and it, it's an opposite feeling, obviously. When there's stands are packed full, you know, everybody's got Johnny's doing his four wide, and, um, you know, the fans all have their phones out and going wild and stuff. You know, that feels good. That gets the atmosphere going, makes it, makes it feel, um, you know, that much more special. So definitely makes you feel good as a driver when you see fans are packed. And then you get the stands uh, hanging out with you after the races, you know, at the car, the autographs, all that. Uh, that's still a really cool part of sprint car racing that I, I hope we never lose. I hope we never get so far away uh, from where we are now today because I, I still think that's one of the coolest points as, as a fan, and I'm sure it is for a driver too. Yeah, it's a very important part of, of sprint car racing or probably any sport in general, but um, you can have one of the worst nights and, um, you know, your attic, attitude can be, you know, down the drain and you come out and there's a little kid standing by in your car and wanting a, you know, autograph card or something and big smile on their face, you know, that can change your night around very quickly. And that's, you know, that's what it's all about. It makes you feel good as a driver and just, you know, you remember being that kid one day uh, looking up to, to other drivers and, uh, you know, you want them coming back one day and, and wanting to be a sprint car fan for, you know, you know, lifelong. So for them to, you know, be out there and just, you know, spend that time, interact with fans, uh, that's what it's all about. You've been out here, like I said earlier, uh, quite a long time, 10th year on the road now. Um, and this may be a better question for a guy like Donnie, but uh, I feel like just the last two or three years that I've been out here, it seems like sprint car racing in general, if you had to put like its popularity on a graph, I feel like it's like slowly climbing in popularity among all racing fans. Do you feel that same way? It seems like every single year it just gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, more of a following on, you know, Twitter or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, me being out here 10 years when I was, you know, a kid just out of high school coming on the World of Outlaw Tour, I didn't think of things that way. You know, I thought of it as something that's going to be around forever. You know, the World of Outlaws is, you know, is what it is. It's the biggest form of sprint car race, and it's going to be around forever. There's no worry about that. And I think when you, as you get older, you start to think about those things a little bit more. But as I'm getting older, you know, I'm 30 years old now, I see, you know, the streaming services, the pack stands, the bigger events, more of them throughout the year. Um, definitely seems like there's, you know, with social media and, and all that, that it's, it's growing in, in all parts of the country. So uh, that definitely makes, you know, everybody that's passionate about this sport, you know, that has a job and a crew members, race teams, um, you know, Word of Outlaws, it just it makes you feel good about where the sport's headed. Another thing you said there was, uh, you know, you're 30 years old now, right? And you've still got a long ways to go in your career. But you know what I've started to notice as well? It seems like guys that I looked up to when I was a kid watching this or that I played as on the old, you know, outlaw game, the 2002 <laughs> game. Like, it seems like more sprint car guys are starting to retire earlier. I, I think of, like, Shane Stewart or, or Darren Pittman or a couple of these other guys that, you know, were heroes for a lot of people. And now they're part-time. They, they got the businesses now. How much longer do you think you're going to be able to do this? How much longer do you plan to do this? Yeah, I know. I was talking about uh, this with Sheldon Hodenshield the other day. And, you know, we talked about, you know, certain drivers that say, hey, we're going to race for a few years maybe. And then, you know, I want to go do something else and that. And Sheldon and I are both like, man, I plan on doing this until I'm like 60 or something. So uh, this is all I know. So I, I plan on doing this for a long time until I start getting my butt kicked consistently every night. I plan on being out here for a long time. Got to at least get one championship, right? Yeah, I hope to get more than one. But, yeah, we're going to work at that for a while. And, um yeah, I, I'd have planned to be out here for a long time and, you know, striving to be the best I can be, whether it's uh, Crown Jewel events, championships, and uh, all the above. All right, there he is, Logan Schuhart, going for his third Jackson Nationals championship here this weekend. Best of luck to you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your time. When we come back, we're going to talk to the driver who finished third in last night's A-Main. Welcome to NOS Energy Endurance Challenge 2.0. Today's challenge is going to demand everything you've got. <laughs> this year, the Volkswagen Beetle is back. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's go, bro. Oh, we're screwed. Jack it up. No. 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 Race. I like this team. Be part of something greater. 
Toyota. Let's go places. Perfection isn't easily achieved. It takes hard work, dedication, and perseverance. Through their commitment to excellence, Sage Fruit Company has been supplying customers with the best tree fruit in the Pacific Northwest for over three generations. They work hard on the farm, in the packing facilities, and with their retail partners to provide consistent, high quality apples and pears all year long. Look for Sage Fruit at your local grocery. We're getting set. We're getting set for night number two of the Agco Jackson Nationals here in Jackson, Minnesota, and we're on the Sage Fruit stage, getting set to go for that second night of racing action. Tanner Holmes joins us here. You're a World of Outlaws racer now. <laughs> I, 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 do you still feel like you're dreaming? What, what's going on? I'm. Uh, I'm just really happy to be here. That's all. <laughs> that's all I know right now, and just um, you know, taking it all in and you know, going one night at a time third last night that has to well, I, mean, I won't put the words in, in, into your mouth did you exceed expectations right out of the box here I think our first night um, definitely went you know maybe better than we expected with uh, with the outlaws luckily we got to run you know one show earlier just to get comfortable but um, you know Jackson I wasn't sure what to expect never been here before and I wouldn't say that this is necessarily just my my type of racetrack uh, we don't have a lot of this out west this is you know be considered fairly larger um, even though it's not you know maybe on the same size scale of Knoxville or Eldora or places out in PA but um, definitely our first night went well and it all started with qualifying, and that's that's big with the Outlaws. So um, I think the goal to replicate it is just to have that much speed early on in the night, and you know get through your heat and get a good shot to have a you know a chance to be in the dash and start up front. So some some people maybe have never even heard of you prior to last night or even today. They still might not even know who you are. But if they're watching this, try to fill them in a little bit of where you came from, where you started at, how you got here, because. I know that three years ago you were a full-time outlaw car racer, and yeah. now here you are. Yeah, basically. So I, I'm from um, Jacksonville, Oregon. It's really far south in the state, about 30 minutes from California. And I grew up racing carts from about 2009 to, you know, Actually, we still race carts in the wintertime just to have some fun, but, um, you know, running them full time up until the last, you know, couple of years um, down in Red Bluff, California. So I'm from the, the outlaw cart scene, Red Bluff Outlaws, Cycleland Speedway. That's where Chase is from as well. And, um, you know, race for Jimmy Elledge and QRC and um, a lot of good talent out that way. And that's kind of what taught me everything I, you know, I learned throughout the years and um, got into sprint cars in 2018 and, you know, ran a lot of like the limited 305 stuff and ran 360s a little bit and then finally got into four tens in 2021 so been um been at it ever since and we've just always you know been racers and uh, you've documented it all the way through obviously have a pretty very successful youtube channel you've got 
a lot of followers on all kinds of social media platforms. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they said that you have got to be one of the top five most popular sprint car drivers in the country right now. And the guy I was talking to compared you almost to the popularity of maybe a Kyle Larson or a Rico Abreu. That might be a little bit early for that, but you are well on your way there. Do you feel like you're that popular of a driver? Last night, there was people cheering for you, you know, in qualifying. You came out, they were cheering and, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you know, um, I, I guess I guess you could say that. I, I'm not I'm not really sure on all those scales. I just uh, I just really enjoy making the content and you know bringing people along for the journey. We started you know all that back in 2016. So basically, people have seen every step from you know back racing carts, literally racing carts with my with my dad, and then you know see me get my first opportunity um, driving with QRC, and then you know now running sprint cars, and then now my first opportunity to to drive for a real sprint car team. So it's uh it's been incredible and it's it's awesome that we get to bring people in for that inside experience and they feel like they know our team they know all, all of our crew and my family and um, you know see all of our highs and lows there are literally thousands of race car drivers across this country but none of them uh, or I shouldn't say none uh, very few of them have the social media presence that you do so why did you choose to kind of break out of that normal quiet you know we're, we're gonna we're not gonna do this social media and, and put yourself out there like that I just feel like you know um, I mean I didn't realize it back then when I started but just in general you were like six years old oh yeah I was very young I was literally 13 years old <laughs> when I started I did not know what I was doing but you realize over time you know I, it was probably right before the internet was I mean obviously the internet's been around but like now social media is just everything it's everywhere um, we all have phones we all do that so I just felt like it was maybe a way to give me an opportunity to get to where I wanted I wanted to be a professional race car driver since I was young and and I thought that maybe in today's age you know um, obviously there's there's so many factors of the sport and you got to have it all so for me it was like if that was a way I could use to support my own dreams of becoming a racer no matter how that came about then that was um, that's what I was gonna do so started and basically just never gave up and now we're here you're here now you're getting a chance uh, to get a taste of what it's like to run with the world of outlaws NOS energy drink sprint car series you just mentioned that where you want to be in uh, your career of racing. So where is it? Where, where's the ultimate dream? I mean, I guess you could say, um, you know, where we're at now is is probably just about as good as it gets. So as far as as far as we how far we've come is is great. But um, you know, definitely being an outlaw would be you know full time for for many years is definitely one of the candidates. I also think it would be awesome if you have you know your own operation to fall back on as well. Nowadays, for sure, uh, you know, there's 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 less opportunities probably just because um, where the sports at. Um, there's just so many seats that are full and they rarely come up. Uh, but right now. You know, getting this opportunity with Shark Racing just kind of through the end of the season is is awesome, and to get to learn from Bobby Allen and all that. Like right now, I'm just you know taking one race at a time and learning as much as I can, and just trying to be a sponge for um, you know everything that's going to happen every night, and kind of get a taste of what it might be to be an outlaw, and then you know figure out where to go from there. Now, I would say most people don't really know that Shark Racing, as far as Logan and Jacob, they were the crew chiefs. They're the drivers and they're the crew chiefs on those cars. Now, with you coming into the mix, who is making these setup calls for you? Is Bobby doing it? Did you bring somebody? Are you making the calls? Who's doing that? Yeah, so right now it's kind of um, we have Tyler, who's our, our car chief, and kind of between I, I would say it's kind of a group effort between I mean all of us as a team, but mainly Ty, you know Tyler and Bobby are are doing that. Luckily too, you know coming from my own operation, I have setup experience, which I by no means trying to come in and, and do anything crazy, but um, luckily with I think w with what I know, just driving the car, giving them good feedback um, can help get us you know farther that's really important that communication which is kind of what we're working on right now for those guys to learn my language and for me to learn theirs as far as what to do to the car and how to make it better throughout the night and one of the hardest things i've struggled with the last four weeks is just these bigger tracks what am i actually feeling because you know coming from bull rings it's just different you know when you're riding around on a curb you're driving spinning out all the time sideways it's just not the same as what what this place is so um yeah just mainly tyler and bobby are are doing that and uh, luckily, having a good teammate in Logan is very helpful, too, because he has so much knowledge on, you know, maybe how to fix a lot of the problems that we're going to experience. I'd say this is probably perfect timing for this opportunity to come about. You run a couple of races out here, tracks you've never been to, but then you head back home. You run Silverdale, you run Skagit, Grace Harbor, places you've raced a lot. But you mentioned the big tracks because after that, 
Yeah. That's where you might be in trouble, right? We're going Eldor, we're going Poor World, we're going Williams Grove. Are you looking forward to those races? Are you a little bit worried because you've never really ran anywhere like yeah. that before? No, I think for sure that's definitely, uh, you know, looking at the rest of the schedule, I was like, okay, this looks good, this looks good. And then, yeah, I mean, three, I think it's two or three straight weeks between Eldora, Port Royal, and Williams Grove, and really just tough racetracks. The good news is at least I'm with a team that's from that area, and of course they've done the Outlaw Tour for so many years. So I think for the perfect situation, me having to go to those places for the first time is much better with a shark racing than, you know, if I took my own car or something like that, just because, you know, it's easy to get lost when the driver's lost and the car's lost. But at least if the if the car's on track or uh, if the car's on track, you know, sometimes the driver can just be that missing piece of the puzzle and, you know, be right up to speed. And I'd also like to add, you know, getting to Pennsylvania could be a huge deal for you because I know that. Uh, the sprint car fans out there are absolutely insane already, yeah. but I'm sure you've got a lot of fans out there as well. I don't think you've raced out there, right? No, I've never been to PA. Uh, the farthest I've made it east is Ohio, so we got to run there just a little bit, but you know, mainly spent a lot of time in Knoxville, just focusing on everything for nationals. So yeah, PA is going to be great. I, I'm um, really excited, and just all that that last leg of the tour. Uh, it's an exciting time of the year. There's some bigger money shows and whatnot, and so everyone's just kind of trying to finish strong. And I think that's maybe the n the nice part, I guess, maybe not being on the tour all year. Is I still feel pretty fresh, and you know I haven't ran any races like these guys have. But um, no matter what, it's going to be really tough. Um, just these guys are as good as it gets. So luckily, last night went well, and the goal would be to always replicate that. But it is also the Outlaw Tour. You talked about uh, all the fans that there are in sprint car racing now, and I think you know, you've made a couple trips into Houston. It's looking at the fan base around your car. You have found a way with your social media presence uh, to connect with a younger fan base in in the sprint car community. How did you become a race fan when you were their age, when you were younger? What got you going into this sport? Yeah, so I'm actually really fortunate to be where I'm at because both my parents didn't race. They were not, um, they weren't race car drivers. They weren't in racing families. Like I'm, I'm a first generation driver. Um, they were just general NASCAR fans. So for me, actually, I got started when my dad presented me the opportunity maybe to race um, as he, him and his buddy collectively, actually, they were doing some work in our family business for a client, and there was a car that the guy had for sale when they were looking at the job site, and so my dad's buddy basically convinced him to, you know, my dad's buddy was a bigger race fan than him, uh, to get the car, and then we went out to the local track, which is known as the Southern Oregon Speedway. It's about 15, 20 minutes from my house, and just ran a bunch of car races there, and back then it was a big deal. Our carts, you know, were a very, very, um, a time when there was a lot of people in, involved there still is but um, more in our local area so got started and just like you know five races one year turns into 10 the next and turns into 20 the next and you know it's uh you're, you get stuck you're you're addicted do you do you still find yourself like in, in a weird place where you're a younger guy now but you you're also so well known like it's it's interesting. It just from the outside, it is. I don't. I can't imagine being in your shoes. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I get what you're saying. Honestly, for me, I think just being so. Um there's so much going on that, yeah, like all of that just is kind of a blur. I uh, like every night at the racetrack, I just know exactly what I need to do and then how we need to do on track. And obviously how you end up wanting to do on track doesn't always go to plan or sometimes it goes better. You just don't really know. But um, I just usually stay. I'm just so focused and glued on what needs to happen that everything else is just a, a blur. Now, I was over there interviewing Bobby earlier, asking him about your run last night, and he was mentioning, you know, T-shirts or whatever, right, and how you're going to eventually have your own T-shirt design here for this whole deal, and that's why he kind of made you the one T, because trying to give your own identity, right? So, uh, and I didn't get hit to hear, hear your opinion on this, but I mentioned to Bobby, maybe on that T-shirt design, it should have the duct tape T on there. I think that would yeah. be a good touch, don't you think? You know, I actually did kind of like that idea. I feel like people would, would I, I, I think that's definitely going to be um, one of the candidates in the works when we go designing stuff, just because yeah, it's funny how it's kind of added to the story, and I know that you know uh, people haven't been sure what the number is or whatever. It's kind of almost changed here and there, but yeah, now I guess it's going to stick as the one T, and we'll see how where it goes. And might as well leave Jacob's name on the side, yeah, him on the wing cap, just just how it is, just like that. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I love it. What's the goal now? We, you got the as we talked about the tour coming ahead. What would when? This whole this whole experience is done. When you look back, sitting here tonight, what would you have to say your goal is here for the next uh, three four months on the World of Outlaw Tour? 
Yeah, you know, I think I'd be lying if I said, obviously, as much as it's a tall task, but if, you know, everything went went right in a night, I think, like, yesterday was a good example. We could contend for a win and get into victory lane, but, um, you know, just to run consistently, you know, help these guys uh, learn from them, learn as much as I can on my end and, you know, do what I can in my spot to help them out um, so they can do their job. So consistent, you know, top or podiums, top five, top ten runs. We're going to be in difficult spots of the country, so just uh, do all we can night in and night out to have speed best of luck to you thank you there he is tanner holmes finished third here last night he'll be looking for another podium run this evening when we come back we'll continue from the sage fruit stage and get you set for night two of the jackson nationals welcome to our world a world of dirt drift and dodging fate a world where all of motorsport collides a world of digging deep, of grit, glory, and bitter defeat. Inhabited by the strong, the fearless, the barely sane. Welcome to our world. Welcome to the world of Nas. Tie Complete Brake Systems, featuring the Supermax TPV two-piece titanium vented rotor. Coupled with our band hub's unique shape, increases airflow through the rotor's curved internal vents we machine into each piece before being bonded together with 16 aircraft grade titanium rivets. Complete your system with titanium piston calipers, front rotor, aluminum billet pedal, billet reservoir, master cylinder, lines, and quick disconnects, and you'll be unstoppable. Smith Titanium, we win obeyed. Job after job, you push productivity to the limit. That's why your case construction fleet deserves the best protection available. Number one engine oil, formulated for oxidation and deposit control and extended drain intervals. Give your equipment the right tools for the job with genuine lubricants from Case Construction. Only available from your case dealer. Perfection isn't easily achieved. It takes hard work, dedication, and perseverance. Through their commitment to excellence, Sage Fruit Company has been supplying customers with the best tree fruit in the Pacific Northwest for over three generations. They work hard on the farm, in the packing facilities, and with their retail partners to provide consistent, high-quality apples and pears all year long. Look for Sage Fruit at your local grocer. Welcome back to the Sage Fruit Stage, night number two of the Agco Jackson Nationals, powered by Fent, as we're getting set for cars to be on the track here in just a couple of hours. Our next guest uh, joining Chase and I here on the stage, fans, give a welcome to Spencer Baston, getting set to go here tonight. Spencer, welcome. Thanks for joining us, and uh, welcome back to the Jackson Nationals. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, it's always a fun event coming here to Jackson. After a long week in Knoxville, you get a couple days of rest up and then uh, head a little further north. So, like I said, it's a really cool event and we're happy to be here. Fifth in, yet in last year's uh, event. Uh, so you had to have a little bit of confidence coming into this week. Yeah, certainly. We, um, yeah, we were good last year. We, we made a lot of prog progress through the week, um, you know, with the, with the point format and having to accumulate points on the two uh, prelim nights, I guess you can call them. It, uh, it makes for a little bit different uh, perspective of, of, you know, just trying to get in and, and get a good spot for Saturday. So we're a little bit further back than we want to be after last night, but uh, put together a strong night tonight. And we shouldn't be uh, too far out of the conversation and at least have a shot on Saturday. You've uh, now you're in your second year as a full time World of Outlaws driver. Last year, I would say you guys uh, exceeded a lot of people's expectations. A couple wins had a lot of top tens, a lot of top fives. This year, you guys do have that one win. Uh, but how would you rate your season from last year to this year? How would you compare them so far? I feel like we've improved in a lot of categories. Um, I think on paper, it doesn't it doesn't look as great as what we feel that it is. Um, 
you know, not being able to qual last year, our strong suit was qualifying. Our, our car early in the night always had really, really good speed, and that sets up for a, a simpler second half of the night, but we weren't able to close and on the second half of the night last year, I thought, as, as much as we needed to be. Um, so in terms of, of driving performance and, and feature performance, I don't feel like we were very good last year in comparison to what we are this year. Uh, just unfortunately, it's kind of shifted tides a little bit, just uh, not being able to qualify quite as well or not uh, not making as many of those dashes. Uh, but through the, the second half of the night, we're, we're definitely in the green, where last year we were more in the red. Um, so I, I think it, it depends how you look at it. Obviously, on paper and from an outside perspective, it looks like we may be behind the eight ball this year. But uh, like I said, I, I feel a lot better in the race car. I feel like our, our feature packages have been really consistent and really co uh, competitive. So that's, uh, that's an essential. So we put it all together, and, and we'll, be, we'll be clicking them off, hopefully. You said you guys have been good in areas from last year compared to this year that are better and vice versa. But one thing that you have improved on, or I don't know if it's really improved on, but from last year to this year, made the Knoxville Nationals main event, something you'd never done before. So I feel like a lot of teams, a lot of guys almost base their year off. If they can make the Nationals main event, that is a big success, and you were able to do that. Yeah, with with it being, of, of course, the biggest race of the year, um, you know, it just it's the biggest crown jewel that we run. It's it's the race with the most hype. It's the race that you prepare for all year long. Uh, so to be able to go there and put it in the show and compete, run on the podium on our prelim night and lock in, uh, just makes for a, a great a great overall reward for the crew guys, all of our partners, our owner Chad Clemens. Um, and so to be able to do that this year, it felt really, really good. You know, in the years past, we haven't really, I haven't struggled per se, just things haven't quite fallen as easily as, as you'd like them to. And uh, I think I've, we've finished, or I have finished, uh, you know, within two spots of the transfer uh, two or three times. So we've been right on the cusp and, and uh, to do it this year was, was definitely special. On your second full season now with the World of Outlaws NOS Energy Drink Sprint Car Series, if you could go back to the start of last season, rolling out of Volusia, ready to make a full-time go of it, to today, what would you say, not on track, but off track for you personally, whether it be your routines or, or how to keep yourself going up and down the road, what have you had to adjust? What have you learned in that uh, year and seven-tenths to, to get to this point? Well, I think I think coming in coming into the War of Outlaws schedule for the first time um, doesn't look terrible. It doesn't, and it isn't terrible. So don't don't let me don't, <laughs> don't let me mix mix that up. Um, it's just a lot more grueling than I think I had expected in terms of of. Uh, you know, you're used to, to being home more with, with whether your families or, or friends or at your normal job or whatever the case may be. And then to kind of just pick up and disappear uh, for, you know, eight months out of the year, really, um, it, it's tough. And I think if you don't mentally prepare for what's ahead, um, it becomes very taxing. And, um, you know, you see a lot of drivers, they'll fly back and forth. Uh, to go home to kind of mentally reset. Uh, some drivers have, you know, their kids with them and wives, and so they have a motorhome. They all live together and travel and try to go do excursions. Um, but what really is impressive to me, uh, or, or what's really kind of surprised me the most, is how uh, hard the crew guys work. You know, I, I'm sitting up here saying how tough it is, but they have the toughest job. They are working pretty much around the clock, whether uh, it's driving to the next track or, or getting to the car wash and maintenancing, uh, getting three to four hours of sleep to get up and do it for the next however many days, and they don't really see a break in the near future. Uh, that's tough. And so that's, I have a lot of respect for all the crew guys that are on the Outlaw Tour and, and uh, in other series as well. So that's been the, the toughest challenge and, and definitely the hardest thing is just the mental aspect to come in fresh every night and uh, stay on that kind of attack mindset where um, you just go in swinging every night. So uh, it's something I feel like I've, I've gotten better at this year. Just with coming into year two, you kind of know what to expect a little bit more. So uh, there's been a few things that I've done personally or tried to prepare for that I feel have helped just my overall um, demeanor and, and uh, kind of psychological part of what we do. 
So you mentioned a couple of guys obviously fly home back and forth. We think of Brad and Carson are kind of those two guys. And then you got a lot of guys out here on the road that are doing the motorhome deal with, with Logan and, and Sheldon, a couple other guys. You decided to go the motorhome route this year. Why did you go for that approach instead of doing the fly back and forth? You obviously, now you're engaged, right? But before you weren't, before you got the motorhome deal. So what was the decision-making process? You're like, I, I want to do the motorhome thing. Well, I think, I mean, it made sense with my, th my uh, fiance Audrey. She she runs her merchandising business and she, you know, takes care of the t-shirt trailer. So for the fact that um, she needs to be here as well, it makes sense, obviously, uh, for us to just both be on the road. And the other the other perspective I took on it too was the fact that I'm going to be a lot more um, in touch with my crew guys. I'm going to be around them a lot more. Even if I'm not hands-on working on the race car, I'm there moral support, grabbing them lunch or whatever they need and just spending time because uh, you, you need to build a lot of chemistry with your with your crew, your crew chief, um, your owner, whatever you can, just because you're your business partners essentially and, and in order to work towards one goal you all have to have the same kind of attitude and, and mindset towards things so I looked at it you know those, both of those ways and I think that that second part of of just spending time on the road and you're just you're really committing um, it's not that uh, Carson or, or Brad or Donnie or any of those guys that fly back and forth aren't committed they have a different way of, of having a fresh mindset so um, for me, I, it's been nice to just spend a little bit more time on the road rather than last year we drive it back and forth a lot, put a lot of extra miles in. So doing it the way we, we've done it this year has, has definitely been an upgrade, and it's, uh, it's, it's allowed you to just kind of stay more in touch with what's happening within the series, within your team. On a week-to-week -week basis, you, you just have a lot more conversations about, okay, what did we do last weekend and, and you know what are the the pros and cons of what we did and how can we improve those for this coming weekend um so it, it's definitely been a good adjustment as a motorhome guy have you had any uh, issues so far blowing a tire having a generator go out or anything like that what i always say is as a hotel guy if my hotel room breaks down i can get a new one with a motorhome you ain't getting a new one you're waiting to get that thing fixed yeah we've had there's been a couple small things uh fortunately I'm able to kind of carry a toolbox with uh, good customer service that can help me fix a lot of those problems and seemingly any of the more uh, drastic issues if we've been bailed out just through circumstances. Uh, we're at one place that I got a flat pulling into the racetrack and on the back side of the property of the racetrack was a uh, semi auto shop and tire shop. So they, they got me fixed up. Good so timing. yeah, perfect timing, but we haven't had anything too drastic. Where do you see yourself going? You, you, we're, we're closing in on the end of your second season. Where do you see yourself going in the next uh, couple of years with the World of Outlaws and with your career? Well, I just uh, we race with with the best drivers uh, when it comes to, to dirt track racing, and um, those best drivers are those top few that are there every single night, no matter what. Uh, becoming uh, a, a competitor with them night in and night out is is certainly my goal. Um, to be at the top of the sport um, and just in the conversation on a nightly basis. You know, guys that have put in the years and the miles, Donnie Schatz, uh, Brad Sweet, David Gravel up to this point, Carson's getting there, Logan. Um, within our series, those are, those are the guys you have to beat every single night if, if you want to win races and, and compete for championships. So um, aligning with, with CJB and, and Chad Clemens and Barry Jackson, um, we have all the tools to get to that point. It just takes a long time. It takes building that chemistry. It takes uh, experiencing and, and kind of mentally preparing and knowing what to expect on the Outlaw Tour. So uh, my goal would be to, to sit up here three years from now and, and uh, talk about, you know, the hunt for the championship or, or something like that. So um, I know it's, it's a lot uh, easier said than done, um, but I'm, I'm certainly willing and, and ready to put in the work to do so. As you uh, continue here the rest of the season, we know you got into the win column at I-55. Um, how many more? I mean, you want to win every night, but what's what's the realistic goal between now and World Finals? I don't know if you really can put a number on it. Sometimes, you know, they, they seem to just fall into place. Ideally, if we could uh, click off, you know, a couple, two or three more, I'd be I'd be pretty happy. I felt like that'd be an improvement compared to last year, um, but would still leave enough on the table for, for next year. So um, competing for wins, podiums are, are the goal every night. 
I've heard a lot of guys mention you as a great advocate for the sport of sprint car racing, and and in the future that could prove to pay dividends as well. But uh, I feel like every time you know we try and talk to you, you're always ready to do an interview. You're always very gracious on that type of thing. So we always appreciate that. But um, do you feel as if you are a good advocate for the sport? You can be the next. Brad Sweet, the next, uh, you know, Donnie Shots. Obviously, he's been doing it for 25 plus years. But do you think you could be that guy that's that face that's been around this series that helps build the brand in 10 years from now? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say whether I, I can be or not. I, I know personally, I think um, if everything goes right, you know, I'd li that's where I'd like to be. But I'm not gonna sit up here and say that. Uh, that's going to be me. That's that's a goal. Everyone has goals. Everyone is motivated by uh, you know the thought of success and the thought of uh, becoming someone that you've looked up to for for a long time. So um, that's that's definitely something I want to do, and and that's uh, what we're working towards every day. Obviously, to have success, you've got to have a great car. You got to have great sponsors as well. And speaking of sponsors. I think you've got one, you know, we've got a couple guys out there that have some corporate sponsors like Donnie and, and Brad and, and Logan as well, but you've got a sponsor that has nothing to do with auto parts or anything like that. You've got a True Timber, a well-known brand, and what I think is cool about it is the, the paint schemes that come out of that. You can do so many different paint schemes with camos. It seems like the fans have really taken a liking to your merchandise too. Yeah, the, the partnership with True Timber Camo is, has been an absolute blessing. Um, you know, tying, <clears throat> tying a name, uh, a driver name with a brand, I think goes such a long ways. And, and I feel like we've, we've worked towards that with, with True Timber Camo and them allowing us to, to utilize their camo patterns just uh, puts on a good display for all the fans. And, um, you know, the dirt racing market, uh, the market that I'm part of, the, the, the life that I grew up living with, with hunting and fishing and just being outdoors, True Timber matches that. That's, that's, their, that's their DNA. So um, it's been a lot of fun getting to interact with the fans and, and some of our customers just uh, because they're passionate and avid outdoorsmen and outdoors women uh, as well. So that's, uh, it's definitely been really, really cool. And, and anytime you get to work with a company like that, you learn so much about business and so much about retail and things like that. So it's, uh, it's been really, really cool. And it's been great to, to add on a lot more than just that too with, with Rothko, Tactical and Outdoor another outdoor company uh, in retail so we, we it's it's been really really cool to, to experience uh, you know these last two seasons with them and and uh, we look forward to the future I was never a hunter or a fisher or anything like that when I was a kid. I was always a video gamer, and Red Tiger Camo on Modern Warfare 2 was always my favorite. So hopefully one day we'll have a Red Tiger <laughs> Camo out there. Hope to see that happen. Yeah. Uh, How do you respond to that? Yeah, no, you, know. you never know. You never know. But uh, no, that's, well, it depends where you come from, I guess. There you go. We'll put that one in the consideration there box for you, I'm Chase. giving a bunch of T-shirt <laughs> yeah, ideas you're, today. You're just a merchandising yeah, guy up here go. today. Spencer Baston, best of luck to you tonight and the rest of the weekend. Uh, enjoy your time here in Jackson. Yeah, thank you. It's always always fun coming up here and talking with you guys. So hopefully the, uh, the fans get to see a good show tonight. All right, there you'll see him tonight in the CJB Motorsports number five. And as we just heard him talk about, the crew job is one of the hardest uh, positions in the form of motorsports. We'll dive into that when we come back to the Sage Fruit stage. Perfection isn't easily achieved. It takes hard work, dedication, and perseverance. Through their commitment to excellence, Sage Fruit Company has been supplying customers with the best tree fruit in the Pacific Northwest for over three generations. They work hard on the farm, in the packing facilities, and with their retail partners to provide consistent, high-quality apples and pears all year long. Look for Sage Fruit at your local grocery. Welcome to NOS Energy Endurance Challenge 2.0. Today's challenge is going to demand everything you've got. This year, the Volkswagen Beetle is back. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's go, boys. Oh, we're screwed. Hey, hey, hey. Jack it up. No. No, no. ARP. The ultimate fasteners for racing in the dirt. With high horsepower demands, ARP delivers maximum clamping force and performance. When failure on the dirt is not an option, it's ARP-Bolt.com. I watched my first race yesterday. You're on the team, kid. It's orientation day. 
new guy. Let's get you up to speed. Punch time! Your workspace is ready. Looks like you got a corner office. Be part of something greater. Toyota, let's go places. It's going to be Kenna McIntosh, 0-8, victorious tonight. Welcome back to Jackson, Minnesota. We're here on the Sage Fruit stage at the Jackson Motorplex for the 45th Agco Jackson Nationals. And we'd like to welcome to the stage the tire specialist, Nate Repitz, for the driver of car number 41, Carson Macedo. So please welcome Nate Repitz to the stage here. Hey, Nate, thank you for having me. Absolutely, Nate. Uh, you're one of the few guys that's not a driver that is on our st stage show, but you recently, I feel like, have kind of gained a little bit of a following here. Uh, you and uh, our friend Tony Laporte have been making these videos, uh, the the um, informing you know race fans on tires, on wings, things like that. And um, I guess the backstory to that is, you know, before you were a tire specialist, you were a teacher at a high school, right? And so now. What's yes, that like to transition from a teacher in high school to now doing this? Well, the transition is very abrupt, very <laughs> sudden, uh, the way it ended up working out. I was a high school ag teacher in Northeast Pennsylvania for two and a half years. Um, and I always wanted to go out on the road and give this a shot because I'd been helping and I'm a central Pennsylvania guy, right? So I grew up around 410 Sprint Cars and World of Outlaws and always wanted to do that and thought I'd be good at the job. Well. I made a contact in college, Lisa Boltz. Her parents were Jonestown KOA and the Boltz family on our car. And she let me know when this opportunity came available. And I said, if I don't do this now, I'm going to regret it. So literally, they hired me. And I walked into the principal's office and said, hey, uh, Miss Allen, I got this incredible opportunity here. I thank you for what you've done for me in my career, but I have to take this. And thankfully, they were very understanding. So that was mid-January. I used the rest of my vacation days to go to Florida. And then in March, I was uh, already in Missouri. Wow. Just like that. Just like that. And how cool is it now to take the, the, old, you know, the old teaching deal, and now you kind of apply it here, and you are now teaching race fans about cars? I feel like that's a pretty cool crossover. Oh, yeah. And I, I honestly miss explaining stuff. It, it's fun, you know, yeah. you get that engagement or that look of understanding, you know, when somebody understands what you're explaining to them. And it really is an art and a craft and something that I miss practicing. And I always say it's more fun when you understand what's going on. So I'm thankful for, you know, the team allowing me to do this, our sponsors being supportive, uh, World Racing Group for doing these videos and giving me that chance to kind of come back and stretch those muscles a little bit. But you don't get the opportunity on the road to send anyone to the principal's office. I mean, that is one one perk that's gone, I suppose. Yeah, send them to the command center. Yeah, there you yes. go. Yeah, they can go talk to Mike after the races. Yes, sir. Uh, let's talk about a typical day on a, a crew with the World of Outlaws, NOS Energy Drink Sprint Cars. Because as, as fans, you know, this morning I woke up, I, I enjoyed some pancakes, I took a nap. It's been a, a calm day. You guys don't get to do that on race day. Not really, no. There's not seven days of the week out here I think what do I always say there's five there's race wash maintenance travel and then on a leap year you have off <laughs> a leap year but 
Uh, normally, for Jason Johnson Racing, we start work at 8 a.m. when we're at our shop, and we go back fairly regularly. And at, on the road, we start at 9 a.m. pretty consistently and uh, take maybe an hour's break for lunch when needed. I'd say a day like this morning, we were up at 9 a.m. Uh, we got our maintenance done probably by 12.30 and then went out to lunch and then came back and I was driving the truck over here about 3 o'clock. Get set up and uh, this time of the day right before the race is usually your most relaxed uh, right before showtime. If everything went right and you had an easy night the night before. Um, but then you also have to remember I went to bed about 1.30 because we wash after the race. so. That all adds up to. Well, and I think it's important to to point out there. You just said uh, about three and a half hours of maintenance on a car that mm -hmm. competed last night. Three laps for hot laps, two laps for timing, a 10 lap heat, a 25 lap feature, all combined, maybe 30 minutes on the racetrack. Oh yeah. But how important is that maintenance to make sure the next night isn't a disaster? I think a good maintenance program is what sets a championship level team like JJR apart from other, say, local teams or other teams out here trying to compete on a circuit. Um, you want to be prepared and have all your T's crossed, I's dotted, uh, have your spares ready to go. Um, maintenance isn't just re-greasing bars and mounting new tires. You know, you're also inspecting everything. Um, I'm inspecting all my wheels for any cracks or chips. Um, if we make contact with the wall, I'm spinning them, making sure everything's torqued and in balance. Clyde will go through and completely, you know, retork the car, and Phil will go through the entire motor, um, just making sure the bugs are there. Um, it's not necessarily about finding something every time, as much as it's not there, um, but just having, yeah, these. Sprint cars are very labor intensive for the amount of laps you actually get out of it. Um, so a good maintenance program is critical to run at a high level. So all these videos you've been making uh, with teaching people and, and you know, I sent, you told me right before we came on here that you, you had somebody made a t-shirt with your face on it and um, we're doing things like this. Yeah, thanks guys. Yeah, and, and also I feel like Carson Macedo is one of the few drivers that will every time he will mention you know, you, Clyde, Phil, every time he's in an interview, right? Giving you guys a little bit of, you know, that satisfaction knowing that my driver cares about everything, right? But have you gained any, a little following from fans? Do fans come up to you in the pit area at races sometimes say, hey, what's going on, Nate? Yeah, I've had a few people say, hey, Nate, how's it going? And I honestly didn't recognize them. I'm bad with names, but I'll remember faces. But that is cool, I will say. Makes you realize you got to always make sure you're carrying yourself as a professional because you never know who's watching now at this point. We've heard, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, at least I have, of, you know, teams looking for crew guys and how hard it is to find guys that want to do this job, right? It, it all sounds very, very fun. And then you get out here and you already mentioned staying up to 1.30, getting up at 8 a.m., all that stuff. How do you find the, the drive to keep going? Even And you're the guy driving the truck, too. You're, you got oh, yeah. more duties than maybe some other guys do. But how do you find the drive to keep doing after long nights and long weekends? I don't know. It sounds too corny to say the love of the sport, really. Um, but really, I come from a, you know, more of an agricultural background with the family. That's how I got into ag teaching, though I didn't grow up on a farm. But it's a lot of those same traits, I think, where you don't necessarily have a job you clock in and out of. It's what you do when you wake up until you go to bed. Um, so I've just been attracted to that kind of stuff, even as an ag teacher. You know, the ag teacher is usually the first at school and the last to leave because of running the FFA program and uh, supervised ag experience visits and everything else that goes a part of that. So I've always been attracted to it, but I won't lie, being a part of a well-known successful team does help. Once you taste that victory lane, you want to keep going back there again and again. Um, but you just really have to take a personal satisfaction from committing yourself to that grind if you want to make it as a top-level crew guy. We talked about that grind so much, how hard it is out there on the road, but what have been some of the coolest moments you've had this year uh, at a track or at away from a track, uh, you know, on an off day or traveling down the road seeing something cool? Hmm. That's tough. I feel like... They always say your second, third year, you find out how much you really like this, and this is my year four, because now you're going back and you're experiencing the same tracks, the same people, same things again. 
I think some of my favorite times, like, I think Lakeside was very uh, satisfactory for us when we ran this one other race. Um, but going from 22nd to second, that was satisfactory. But then I appreciate the times we get to spend with friends of the team and sponsors, like uh, going to see Dennis Albaugh at his place and experience his car collection or going out to dinner with the Sage and Bolts family. Um, things like that are really what make it worth it here at the end of the day. It's the people. Yeah, it really is. It's the community that you're a part of, this traveling circus. So you've obviously been a crew guy or a tire specialist, I should say, for the duration of your time with JJR. Is there any aspirations to maybe do something more than the tires? Would you want to be a car chief one day? Would you want to be Phil Dietz someday and be a crew chief? I don't know about crew chief, but we'll see. Um, there's always talks, things that are going on. So, um, but I'm always willing to uh, go out there and learn new things and take advantage of opportunities, just like I jumped on this road job. Really cool. Uh, thank you for your perspective and uh, best of luck this weekend. Thanks for thinking of me and thank you everybody for coming out. How about it, fans? Nate Repitz, you'll be uh, working away here t this weekend on the Jason Johnson Racing 41. That's going to do it for our time here from the Sage Fruit stage. We'll continue our uh, festivities here at the racetrack and uh, we'll continue to get you set for tonight's Agco Jackson Nationals with continued coverage here on Dirt Vision. Welcome to NOS Energy Endurance Challenge 2.0. Today's challenge is going to demand everything you've got. <laughs> this year, the Volkswagen Beetle is back. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's go, boys. Oh, we're screwed. Hey, 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 jack it up. No. Oh, no. Let's go. race. I like this team. Be part of something greater. Toyota. Let's go places. Dirt Vision presents World of Outlaws NOS Energy Drinks Sprint Cars. Another big slider there. Allen crosses back underneath him. The best drivers, the best coverage. I'm Chase Robin, ready to bring you all the action. Time for the most awesome sight in all of motorsports. It's time to watch the greatest shows on dirt on Dirt Vision.
Late August in southern Minnesota, as the great Jackie Stewart would say, it's a great day for a motor car race. And fresh from the Sage Fruit stage and Race Day Live, welcome to Dirt Vision's pre-race coverage of night number two of the 45th Agco Jackson Nationals. And from the Minnesota Motorplex, I'm Dave Reef. Let me be the first to welcome you inside the North Carolina Dirt Vision studio, where we are locked and loaded for day two of the Jackson Nationals, one night after long-term vision met short-term motivation in victory lane. You know, when the year began, James McFadden was already a five-time winner with the greatest show on dirt. But as he entered his second full season as wheelman of the veteran Roth 83 Motorsports team, the Australian also knew there was plenty of unmatched potential. While pushing outside of the comfort zone, the skills and capabilities that they are developing allowed him to double his career win total after finding victory lane last night at the Jackson Motorplex.